work, so hopefully you either did that or you're at least going along and pretending that you did. And we're going to want to find the t value where the particle experiences maximum acceleration. So when we say maximum acceleration, acceleration is a vector. So how do we have a maximum of a vector? Well, there'll be a different vector for each t value. But of all those infinite number of vectors, how do we know? How can we talk about the maximum vector? So we're look at the magnitude. So that's a property that there'll just, there'll just be a number. And then whatever has the biggest or maximum magnitude will be our maximum acceleration. So we're going to take, so we're going to maximize magnitude r double prime of t. So we got r double prime. We're going to square each term, add them together. So we're going to get 4. So 2 squared is 4. Co squared plus sine squared is 1. So both the first two terms add up squared to be 4. Plus 10 squared is 10 squared, 100. Now I'm going to write this as cos squared minus sine squared. Squared. So now we have a function, a real valued function of t. How do you maximize a real valued function? So get derivatives set equal to 0, find whatever solutions make it uh, the derivative 0. And then you can also compare when you plug the t value back in to see if it was um, a maximum minimum. We can also take the second derivative as another way. And if the second derivative is we want frowny face to get a maximum. So if our second derivative is negative, critical point second derivative is negative, we have a maximum. So this is stuff from Calculus 1. So that was a long time ago, maybe over the summer, if you're lucky, probably over the spring or last winter for most of you. So a very long time ago. So do we really want to take derivative with a square root? No. So we can either maximize this uh, magnitude right here. What if we max maximize the uh, square of the magnitude? That'll work. I don't have to worry about it being negative. If we have a plus minus problem and I squared it, you know, negatives will square three positives. But I know that this magnitude is never going to be negative. So I don't have to worry about, you know, if I square it out, maybe I'll get some negative solution. But in this case, we won't get negative solutions here. So what we're really going to do is maximize the squared uh, magnitude. So we have it's derivative of 4 is zero, uh, 0. So we have 10 squared times the power 2 times cos squared t minus sine squared t times 2 cos t times negative sine t minus 2 sine t cos t. So what you do is you set your derivative equal to 0, and that'll get your critical point. So we're looking for a critical point here.
I'm throwing away constants. I just threw away 100, uh, 100 times 2, so I just threw away 200. Why am I allowed to do that? So I'm using a zero product property. So I got three things multiplied together. Well, four if you count the 10 squared and the two separately. But basically, three things multiplied together. I know that 200 is not zero. So it's going to be one of the other two. And then I looked in here and said, oh, this is negative 4 cos t sine t. I don't care about the negative 4. I just want cos t sine t. So that could be zero. Or cos squared minus sine squared could also be zero. So this is our zero product property. What other algebra can I do? I could. Remember, we're solving an equation uh, equal to zero, or solving an expression equal to zero. So if I could factor out even more, this would be even easier. What can I factor? Yep, conjugates. So we got cos squared minus sine squared. So it's cos minus sine times cos plus sine. It's going to have a lot of solutions. <laughs> we had to restrict where t lives. No, we'll just write all the solutions. Oh, we still take a second derivative. I don't remember this problem being so hard the last time I taught this class. All right, so there's three solutions. Either cos t equals sine t. The second one, cos t equals negative sine t. And the third one, actually there's really two happening here. Either cos itself is 0 or sine itself is 0. There's really four factors hiding here. Where on the unit circle does cosine equal sine? Pi over 4, 3 pi over 4. And if we think of cos t being the negative of sine, so they're the same but opposite signs, that'll be, well, that would be 3 pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4. So I can combine these two together and write out their solutions. And they'll be all the quarter points right here, all the pi over 4. 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, 7 pi over 4. How about cosine equals 0? Where does that happen? So it'll be pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, and then sine t equals 0 will be 0 or pi. So that's a lot of solutions. We can put them all together really nicely. They're spaced out perfectly, aren't they? Let's pretend I planned it like that. So we put both of them onto that unit circle. Now we'll combine them both together. And that's the worst unit circle. All right, so there's our eight solutions on the unit circle. So I can pick any of these. Let's go with 0. Plus, how much are they separated by? We can just measure the separation of the first two. All right, pi over 4. 0 plus pi over 4. Uh, I think we use the letter K a lot, or N, one of the two. Uh, this is for any K in Z. All right, so these are all the critical points. 
And then we have to figure out when is the second derivative negative will give us a local maximum. So we'll say the t value is called t naught. We'll have a local max at t equals t naught when. So we already checked our triple prime t naught equals zero. And what we haven't checked yet is our quadruple prime. It's a little silly to keep writing the little marks up there of t naught is negative. So that means frowny face, concave down but that will give you a local maximum right there. So hopefully this minimum, like, I think they call this extrema in your calculus book. Yeah. They call this extrema. So, so we're gonna the derivative of the acceleration again or of the magnitude of acceleration? Oh. We well, actually have to be careful the order depends on, so we took two derivatives and then magnitude and then a, a another derivative. So what I wrote down is wrong. So this is r double prime of t magnitude d dt. We took two derivatives of r and then magnitude and then a derivative. The order is important. And now it's definitely not r to the fourth, or r fourth derivative t. We'll just redo all this. So we have r double prime t naught magnitude d dt squared less than zero. So we took the second derivative of the magnitude of the acceleration. The acceleration was the second derivative of the position. So we'll go back to our magnitude. All right, this one is pretty ugly, so I think this is a good place. So I'll set up the derivative, but won't um, calculate it and then plug in the t value. So this is a pretty ugly question. So we wanted to maximize this uh, square root right here, which is the same as maximizing the square of it. So we'll take this one right here, and then uh, it will be the derivative of this that I just put the asterisk on. Well, the good news is we don't have to worry about, it's really important positive versus negative. So the fact that I basically just threw out a negative four is gonna have a very big impact on this. Because now I don't care if it's zero or not, I actually wanna know is it greater than zero, less than zero. So the fact that I took a negative four out is crucial here. So let's carefully reduce this. So I got a negative four hiding out on the right side. So we have 100 times two is 200 times negative four is negative 800. Cos t minus sine t, I'm gonna factor this out to cos t plus sine t times cos t sine t. So we'll take the derivative of this.
So I think we're taking the second derivative of the magnitude squared, if I want to write it correctly. So it is the t derivative. That's what we wrote up there with the asterisk. So it's a t derivative of negative 800 cos t minus sine t times cos t plus sine t. cos t sine t. All right, you do have a quadruple product rule to do here. So let's talk about how do you do a triple product, and then that'll basically be just like a quadruple product. So I'm going to write dot, dot, dot. So you would take that derivative and then plug in um, pi over 4 times k. Figure out what k values make it negative, which ones make it positive, or, it, or you just really care which ones make it negative. So let's do a, so let's just copy right off of the board above. See, so copy that right out of your notes. So if you have a uh, triple product, how do we do that? Well, let's start with the regular product rule. So there's regular product rule with U's and V's. It's probably the version that's on your notes. Maybe used F and G, but it doesn't matter what letters you use. So we're going to do UVW. Well, I don't know the triple product rule off the top of my head. You can probably guess at what it is, and you might be right. But what I do know is if I associate, I have two choices. I could associate like this, or I could associate the second two. And it doesn't matter which two I associate first. Remember, in math, there is no try, there's only do. So I don't know the triple product rule, so I'm going to write a triple product as a regular product, just a product of two things, and then apply the product rule. Absolutely. I wrote that up there, hopefully. Yeah, good. All right, so we're almost done. What's the only thing we have to do now? I'll use the regular product rule on the UV prime. So basically to handle that derivative. So that's U prime V plus UV prime W. So what did I leave out or forget to do? So we should use some, so I just expanded the UV prime but that whole thing is times w. So we have parentheses, and now u prime v w plus u v prime w plus u v w prime. Now if I would have associated the v w instead of the u and the v, it would have been very similar, except I would have expanded, my second step would have expanded on the right term and it would have came out to the same thing. So this is UVW prime. What letters after W, is that X? All right. Take a guess at what UVWX prime is going to be. I'll give you a hint, there's four terms. Yeah, so write it out four times and then prime each one in each term. So, you know, u gets the first prime in the first term, then v, and then w, then x.
All right, so there's quadruple product rule. Sweet. And then you're probably going to have to reduce it because it's going to be really ugly. So use some of your trig skills and reduce it down, and then you can plug in pi, uh, pi over 4 times k. All right, so we're about to go into vector derivative rules. So this is a good segue. So if you're helping a calculus one student and they ask you about the product rule, don't say it. It's just like the uh, triple product rule. Well, you're going to have to take a long time to explain that one. <laughs> so we have a function. f goes from r to r. So it's a regular function that we're used to. u and v are functions from r into rn. So they're vector valued functions. So we were calling them uh, r above. So I'm just going to call these functions u and v. You could think of f as a scalar function, and u and v are vector valued functions. So f is going to function a lot like a scalar. u and v are going to function like vectors. And all the inputs we're going to call t. So these are all going to be d, d, t, just like the derivatives that we have been doing on the whole page. And c is a constant n-dimensional vector. So c is a constant, but now it'll be a constant vector. I don't think we're going to need an alpha, like a constant uh, scalar. So at least not in the notes here, we won't need a constant scalar. All right, what do you think the derivative of a constant vector will be? So it would be the zero vector. <laughs> so make sure your zero is a zero vector. Pretty good. Thank you. I'm a little worried. I didn't write what C was in my notes. Now it's looking like it's a scalar because of the next property. I'll write the next property down. I don't think I mean dot product. All right, because of this property, C, you can't multiply a vector times another. Oh, no, we're OK. All right, I know why. So this is not a dot product. C is a vector, but what is f of t? What's the output of the f function? One. It's a scalar. So this is a vector. It's actually a vector. The, the vector is c. The scalar is f of t. So this is vector multiplication, where we're taking the derivative. In this case, we have a constant vector times a scalar function. And this is times a scalar function. All right, that's the first property. So I'm not going to keep writing of t of t each time. I think I'll do it once more just to make it clear. But these are all these functions f, u, and v are all functions of t. So you could write f of t, v of t, or f of t, u of t. So here, f times v, this is just scalar times vector. So this is just regular scalar multiplication happening right here. And if we take a derivative, what rule do you think we're going to have to use? 
almost. So before we had constant multiple rule. That was the, the so the first rule was constant vector, derivative of a constant is zero. The second rule was constant, uh, constant times function is constant times derivative of the function. So that was constant multiple rule. Except it's weird because your multiple's a vector in that case. So it's a little bit strange. All right, the next one, f is a scalar but not constant. v is a vector function, also not constant. So what rule do you have to use when you multiply uh, two functions together and take a derivative? Product rule. Product rule. All right, good. We just wrote that one down. So this is going to be f prime v plus f v prime. Now f is still a scalar and v is still a vector. So you're going to have two scalar multiplications happening, giving you two vectors, and then you add those together. So this one's really nice. The derivative of u plus v. Yep, u prime plus v prime. Now, of course, same thing happens if I put a minus. So to be complete, we'll go plus or minus, plus or minus. So that's just a sum rule or difference rule. Why does this not make sense? U times V. There are two vectors. So when I say times, there's two ways to do a product. What is one way? In, so dot product. So we call it a product. Before the algebraic properties, we distributed multiplication across uh, addition. That's one reason we call it a product. Another reason we call it a product is the way it behaves in calculus. So if you take a derivative of any product, it better behave in the product rule sense. So that means u prime. Now we have to do dot product. So this is how the dot product behaves with the derivative. It's a regular product rule, except your product is now dot product everywhere. So that's another reason that we call it a pr product. So the other product is cross product. And again, we call this a product because it behaves with the product rule. Last one's a little bit tricky to think about. So in this case, we are the input of u instead of just being some t value is going to be f of t. So this is actually the chain rule right here. So this is scalar. So instead of just getting the, the number t in, it's going to get the number t. It's going to f that number, turn it into a new number, and that's going to be the input for the u function. So this is function composition happening right here. And this is u prime is exactly what you think. u prime of f of t times regular f prime t. So why is that? Not a dot product or scalar, or a dot product or a cross product. It's a it's going to be by so f prime of t is a number. It's a scalar, so it, it's not a vector. So it's just a regular multiplication happening right there, a scalar multiplication. So the moral of the story: derivatives behave like they did before. You just have to be careful about what product you had is the product you're going to get out of the product rule. So if it was a cross product, you get cross product. If it was dot product, you get dot product. If it was scalar product, you get scalar product. So that's the end of our uh, vector derivative rules, at least for now.
So we're going to look at vector functions that have a constant length. So if R of t has a constant length, that means that no matter what input you're using, your output has the same magnitude. So that means for all t, the magnitude is going to be some constant c. And this is for all t uh, in the domain. So if I square the magnitude, I'll get that number c squared. So I just square both sides. Nothing special happening there. Now if you remember way back to vectors, the vector dot product with itself is magnitude squared. So your square of your magnitude is your vector dot product with itself. And I'm going to use that property over here. So this is r, r t dot r of t equals c squared. And next, we're going to take a derivative. So we're going to take d over t t of the equation we just have right there. So we're going to go d dt rt dot r of t equals c squared. So I am going to do the derivative of c squared, which is, now it's not the number 0. Yeah, it is the number 0. Yeah, the number 0, because it's a magnitude. All right, you are going to do the derivative on the left side. It's not hard to give you all the rules right up above. So just use the, uh, it's a product rule. You just product, your product is now the dot. So make sure there's a dot between each one. All right, so you got basically r prime dot r plus r dot r prime. Is the dot product commutative? Yes. Yep, u dot v equals v dot u. Not true with the cross product. Cross product, you get a negative sign if you flip them around. But dot product, they're certainly uh, commutative. So I can write it as 2. Doesn't really matter the order. We'll go r prime t dot r t. And still got zero on the other side. We'll both divide both sides by two. R prime t dot r of t equals zero. So you've got two vectors, and their dot product is zero. What does that mean about the two vectors? Orthogonal. Orthogonal. Mm -hmm. So this means the rate of change, or the derivative, is orthogonal to the original vector. And this was true for all t in the domain. 
So the property still works for all T in the domain. So if we think of a real example of this, probably a velocity is constant. So if your velocity is constant, or I should say your speed is constant, meaning your magnitude of your velocity is constant, that means all your acceleration, the derivative of your velocity, is orthogonal to the direction you're traveling. So this circle doesn't need to be a unit circle. It also doesn't need to be in two dimensions. This could be a three-dimensional sphere. could be a four-dimensional sphere, five-dimensional sphere. So you should be wondering, how in the world do you draw a, a, a three-dimensional sphere on your paper? Here's how you do it. I'll just call that R2, and I'll call this one R. So I have two dimensions going that way and one going up. It's a little strange, but that's how you can do it. You can break down a space into, as long as you add up, you know, one plus two, we have three dimensions total right here. So our vector r of t will be right here. No matter what t value, uh, we're going to be the same magnitude, so the same distance from the origin. So that's what it means to have the same magnitude. You're the same distance from the origin. So it's a good thing to think about a sphere or a circle. It's a two-dimensional, three-dimensional analog of that. So that means r prime, or the rate of change, is going to be perpendicular. So we're going to draw a tangent right here, or a perpendicular line to our original vector. So whatever acceleration we experience is going to be in this direction that I just um, wrote down. So depending on where your next vector is going to be, so if t is increasing and you want it to go counterclockwise, the re regular way around the circle or the sphere, your acceleration vector would be that direction. So it would move you, it would rotate you that way. Now, what do you think would happen if your acceleration went that direction instead? So it would move you a little left, but it would also move you a little sort of outwards or away from the origin. It's obviously not perpendicular, so it won't preserve the magnitude of our original vector. It'll make, in this case, it would make it the magnitude increase. It would have a sort of pulling or an outwards uh, change to it, so the vector would get longer in addition to rotate. Same thing if it was being pulled inward and to the left. It would be rotating to the left, but it would be shrinking like that. So if you want to, for example, get an orbit, you need to uh, figure out exactly, uh, you don't want to be, you want your acceleration to be perpendicular to where the planet is. No, that's not right. Let's not try to do real world examples. <laughs> that's probably good enough right there. Gravity pulls you towards the planet, so your rate of travel has to be perpendicular to gravity. But if it's too big, you will sort of move away from the planet. And if your velocity is too small, you'll move towards the planet. So different way. That's not exactly what I'm talking about right here, but it's pretty close. OK. So this was all about derivatives of vector valued functions. So next up, we're going to do integrals of vector valued functions. So we'll have just enough time to write down the definition. So integrals of vector valued functions.
So just like we use lowercase f and capital F, I'll use lowercase r and capital R here. So big R is an anti-derivative of little r if d dt of big R equals little r. Thus, integral r dt equals big R plus c. So that's exactly the way antiderivatives looked before, except we use big F and little f. I haven't really told you what the integral means yet, but we've seen what derivatives are. So certainly the first of those two. You can take a derivative of a vector function, and if it's this other one, then you know it's an antiderivative.